All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. And item two on our agenda is a discussion regarding the City of West Dallas self-funded health and dental insurance plans, fund and funds and funding levels, plan design and premium contributions. Mr. Chair. Ms. Grill. Rebecca Grill, City Administrator. I'm joined by Alex, um, who is with our with Horton, our benefit consultant, and Peggy Stino, our finance director. Um, after the last couple meetings, we thought it would probably be a good idea to go back and talk about um, the budget and the budget um, implications of our health plan and things like that, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation that's being perpetuated by some people. So I just wanted to go through that first. I know most of you are familiar with it already. So. Um, as we talk about every year um, with our budget, we have a, a number of fiscal constraints. As time goes on, as the city infrastructure gets older, the constraints become even greater. So the biggest impact for the city of West Dallas is the expenditure restraint program. I'll get into a little bit more about what that is um, in the following slide. Uh, we also have facility repairs and maintenance that we need to do. We had a facilities audit done, uh, I believe it was in 2017. There's about $60 million worth of repairs and maintenance that needs to be done on our aging buildings. We, you're also familiar, familiar with the street light conversion. Um, they've stopped producing our bulbs. And so we have a supply that may last us anywhere between seven and 13 years, um, but we need to convert the street lights, the impact of that on the budget and taxpayers is going to be 40 to $60 million. We also have a number of street and sewer replacements. We're behind on those um, each year. The cost to do complete those goes up and up. And then we have also the taxpayer financial lim limitations. 13% um, of our residents here are at or below the poverty rate of 25,750. Another fiscal constraint that we're not subject to right now, but we could be at some point are the levy limits. So going in a little bit about the expenditure restraint program, this is um, aid provided by the, by the state to municipalities to limit the growth in spending. That means limit the increase of your budget from year to year. It's calculated, um, it's the last year's payment, the rate of budget growth cannot exceed inflation, plus um, the growth on municipal property values. Our 2020 limit is 1.45 million, and that's about 3% of our annual, less than 3% of our annual budget. So as you're familiar with being on this committee, the revenues that we have must e equal the expenditures. We can't spend more than we take in. And then we can't spend more than the expenditure restraint limit to receive the expenditure restraint payment. Going back to the budget, uh, $54 million of our budget is personnel expenses. 16.3 million of that is health insurance. A third of that is for um, retirees. 86.1% of the general fund budget is salary, wages, and benefits. Uh, in our OPEB liability, you're familiar with that, the other post-employment benefits. Uh, in 2017, that was $147 million. Uh, we made some adjustments to the active plans and that was reduced to 118.7 million. This affects uh, our bond ratings and our ability to borrow. And I wanted to get into uh, a little bit about what the city's health plan is. Um, the city self funds its plan, which means we have all the risks of the plan. We don't pay a company to cover the claims and things like that. We, we cover all of those um, as they come in. We pay the premium share for the employees and the employees now share that, but then all the claims that come in, we have to budget for um, through
through property tax and through um, the premium share that people pay. Um, we have a lot of um, claims, millions of dollars that claims come in. Some people go through some challenging situations in their life and they might have um, utilize our insurance plan heavily one year. We do have stop gap, stop loss insurance to cover those catastrophic claims. It currently kicks in at $175,000. Here's a little bit more about the fully insured versus the self-funded. Uh, the fully insured benefit levels are determined by the insurance company. We pay the premiums to the insurance company and then the premiums are based on your size, population characteristics and utilization. <coughs> the claims are paid, like I said before, by the insurance company and all the risk is assumed by the insurance company. Um, people that go with fully insured plans um, have know each month what they're going to be paying out. The city's plan is not like that. An example of a fully insured plan that the city does have is our Care Plus dental plan. Self-funded self plans, the benefit levels are subject, um, determined by the employer, subject to the budget. Premiums that we pay the city taxpayers as well as employees and retirees, they go to the city health fund and they're based on actual cost and they're calculated by actuaries. We um, look back on the last 12 months experience and um, usually that helps. Um, calculate what the premiums may need to be for the following years. Claims are paid by the health fund and then the risk is borne completely by the city and the funding sources, but it's mitigated through the stop loss coverage. Um, the city's health plans and standard dental plans are self-funded -fund plans. Just wanted to go over a little bit of the changes in the budgeting and personnel and the abilities of cities that were given and taken away um, and then how the city chose to implement that over the past few years. And as you're aware, familiar with Act 10 um, was implemented in 2011. It required employees to contribute 50% of their pension payment in addition. Um, previous to that, none there was no payments by employees. It was just borne by the taxpayers and the city totally. Um, additionally, health care insurance contributions, employees are supposed to pay at least 12% of the cost of premiums. Um, collective bargaining for um, all employees for except protective services and transit employees was limited to wages only. Um, the fiscal impacts of the Act 10 also was a reduction of our shared revenue. Um, the expenditure restraint formula changed from a floor of 3% to a floor of 0%. So that what that means for us is I think we've been coming in at like 1.2.3 this year. Okay. So um, seemingly it was a much more previously plus the shared revenue. Um, the $1 million that was taken out of that. In the 2011 to 13 budget, um, pension and health insurance were prohibited subjects of collect collective bargaining. They s further um, specified that. And then in 2013, um, Act 20 Im impacted the public safety employees. And it says that um, they may only bargain for the premium contribution. We're prohibited from bargaining about anything else than the premium contribution, design, selection, and the impacts. Um, so that's very notable um, of, of the following slide of what the city has done over the past few years. Um, in the last 12 years, I guess, um, Medicare was eliminated for new hires in 2008, the years of service to qualify for retiree insurance was changed from 10 years to 15 years. Uh, in 2012, uh, retirees who leave the program aren't eligible to come back. That was um, added for police and fire unions in 2016. Um, the next one, the 2013, uh, rolling with the actives began. 
Uh, that was a retirement benefit level adjusting with the actives. That was something that was negotiated with the existing police and fire unions. That I believe is one of the most impactful cost um, implications for people that have retired after 2013. Um, I believe the agreement to do that was tied with some increases. I read through the, um, the packet, um, but I wasn't present at that. Um, premium share was also tied to the HRA participation, and then it started with 5 and 10 percent. 2015, 7.5 and 15. Uh, the retiree rate increases mirrored, mirrored the actives through 228.15 in, um, that should say 3.115. In 3.115, the weighting, weighted premium calculations began um, as part of the budge, budget <coughs> process prior to me starting here that was decided that um, <coughs> They would do that. With, so the actives got 5% increase. The retirees were 11%. If the true cost of the plan were assigned to those groups, the actives would have decreased by approximately 9%, and the retirees would have increased by 20%. Uh, in 2016, the premium share went to 10 and 20%. The pre and post 65 retirees were separated because <coughs> the post-13 um, retirees roll with the actives. So um, any plan design changes or anything like that also affect those retirees, whereas the only thing that affects the pre-13 retirees is increases in premiums. So that was the thought process about separating those, um, those two. Uh, in 2016, we had the network change, 31% um, reduction in rates during that time. 2017, we didn't change anything with the premium share. The weighted premium was 8.4 for the actives and the pre-13 retirees, and I think that should be post-13 retirees, and then the pre-13 retirees are 9.2. Uh, Total benefit package was implemented. Now people have to work here for 20 years to qualify for 10 years of retiree health care. Retiree health care ceases at Medicare eligibility. 2018, we did not change the premium share. The weighting, weighted premiums were 5% for the actives, 10% for the retirees. Then in 2019, um, the premium share, well, that's <coughs> supposed to be 20 Free one of 20, the police are going to 14%, while mm -hmm. the others are remaining at um, 12 and 20. And then we're um, recommending the 7% increase for the actives and the 11% for the retirees. So this is just an outline of what's happened over the past few years related to the um, health care and benefits. Um, when uh, we started working with Horton and we had the Employee Benefit Committee. We did a survey of our comp comparables, the cities that um, we weigh ourselves against, and we looked at the deductibles and the coinsurance level. This is from 2018, so the data is a little bit older. I think, Alex, you're familiar with some of those already yeah, going up. So, for example, the Village of Menominee Falls. Um, when we conducted the survey, they had a deductible under $500. I can tell you that's now up to $2,000, $4,000. Um, their Medicare people are above that. But what about the, the active plan? I think it's I think it's $1,000, 2000 1000 $2,000, So it's, it's since doubled. Um, the city of La Crosse has remained the same. They're at $400, $800. Um, those are a list of, oh, and city of Racine, they just went to an HSA plan. Um, so their deductibles are, I believe, 1500 3000 now, and it's everything counts towards the deductible. They don't have any copays. Um, so those are just a few of our clients that are on that list, and they've, besides La Crosse, the other two have changed dramatically since this survey was conducted. Thanks. <coughs> okay. um, 
Just an explain about normal retirement age. This is going to make a little more sense when I get into talking about some of the other retiree benefits that our comps have. So general employees, the normal retirement age is 65. Protective service, it's age 53 or 54. Um, and then elected officials will be 62 or 65, depending upon when you started. So sometimes people will take a reduced um, retirement benefit um, and retire prior to the normal retirement ages. Um, some, you know, general employees might leave at age 55. That's the earliest. Um, police and fire could leave at 50 or so. So. Um, as we get into the uh, the comps, you'll see why this makes a difference. I just wanted to explain what this was. Um, so I just went through the police and fire contracts and highlighted uh, the retiree premium info um, of the of the comps. Is it? It's Blair. reflecting. Um, so some of them have a different structure. For their retirees, you can see um, the Brookfield to give $500 per month, um, and then sick leave is included in that. Um, and then there's a biweekly payroll contribution of $115 when you're in active service for your retiree benefit. The Franklin <coughs> Police and Fire, um, they both pay set. The city pays 75% and the retirees pay 25%. Um, their pr premium is frozen at the time when they left. After 2010, any new employees have to have 20 years of continuous service and they must meet the statutory normal retirement age. So that goes back to the, the information that I provided on the last slide. Um, I, with Greenfield, if they retire at the normal retirement, um, they pay equal but not greater to what they paid as an active until they become Medicare eligible. Um, and then once they're at Medicare eligibility, they are not, no longer allowed to be on the plan. Menominee Falls talked a little bit about their um, benefit plan. They work with a trust um, account and make contributions for those. Um, New Berlin Police and Fire, um, they have premium payment banks. Um, they can also change their sick leave hours into things, but after 2011, they have 75% of their earn earnings deposited into a health plan. Um, once a year, and or actually, I think it's quarterly, and then each year it's a one percent more um, on top of that. Um, New Berlin Police, they have the trust; it's a specific amount, and then it rises by the one and a half percent. North Shore Fire, if you're hired after 2009, um, you would pay um, 35 percent. Employer pays 65. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I didn't dig into what it was before 2009. Um, Oak Creek Police, the benefit level modifications, meaning the plan design changes, apply to all retirees. Uh, in, if you were hired after 2015, you don't get any health care. They um, contribute to a VEBA account, and the information, the amounts are listed up there. South Milwaukee, um, the retirees have to pay the full premium from age 50 to their whatever their normal retirement age, and then the city pays 70% um, from normal retirement age to, six, to 59, and then 95% for um, 60 to 64 years of age. Same for the police, St. Francis, city pays 80% uh, frozen at the time of retirement, they get coverage for a maximum of 12 years or Medicare eligibility, whichever comes first. Um, TOSA, if you're hired before 1992, the, pr the premium doesn't exceed 110% of the preceding premium. 
Who's the, the city share or the Louisiana um, share? Yeah. <laughs> I think I think it's the um, the city share. Sure. Yes. And then um, yeah, it's it's more laid out in under the police. So so then <coughs> in twenty oh eight people they have to pay fifty percent um, each year and then the Waukesha City pays 50% of the premium until they become Medicare eligible and there's no Medicare coverage. Oh, I didn't note it in each of these, but the majority of them do not have Medicare coverage like the city of West Hallis has for those people that were hired prior to 2008. I just wanted to go a little bit more over the employee benefit survey that we did with the employees here. Um, we collected information to find out if we do changes in benefits, what's more important to them. And um, here's our, there's a few um, <coughs> slides that I included here. This has to do with um, if your spouse has insurance plan, why do you take the cities instead of that? Um, Mostly it's because the city's plan is better than their spouse's coverage. Um, and then the second would be their, that's the only option. They probably, their spouse might not have coverage through their employer or they might not be employed outside the home. One, <clears throat> one interesting thing on this slide is we talk about the family savings plan. We kind of, we don't know what the savings are going to be, but according to this survey, while 40% wouldn't be eligible because they don't have other coverage, that would imply that 60% do have access to a health plan that could benefit from enrolling in the family savings plan, so. And I believe there were like 300 people that um, responded to this survey when we conducted it. <coughs> um, <coughs> the employees who reported they were enrolled in their spouse's plan, these are the reasons why um, they chose that over the city's plan. Mostly, um, it seems like people didn't understand the question because the, they were actually using the city's health insurance, um, but there were a few other um, actual other responses where people might be enrolled in their parents' plan, um, the network's more appealing, better coverage, less expensive. I would venture to say that probably another municipality, but I don't know <laughs> how many private um, companies have that, um, and then, or a retiree plan. This is a little bit smaller, but we're trying to rank the items that were important to employees about the health insurance. Um, the number one thing they wanted to focus on was keeping their health insurance premiums at or at similar levels. Uh, the second most important, go from 47% down to 15, that's maintaining the pre-Medicare retiree coverage. And um, about 7% were interested in maintaining the post-Medicare retiree coverage. Um, then we also asked about if they're currently enrolled in the plan, if they would like a broader network, what would they be willing to do? Um, when you put it into dollars and cents, a lot of people then felt that our provider network was adequate. And nearly half of all employees plan to use the city's health insurance upon retirement. So then we talked about rising health care costs. Um, what should we, what should, what should we look at? Should we do across the board increase um, or adjust the plan structure? So it's almost a 50-50 split, but 47-53. Um, but you know, this is one of the most important things, the, the things that are important to the active employees and probably all of the people that when they were employed here was the competitive salary and the base pay. That's regardless of their tenure. <coughs> so I just thought it was important to go through a little of those things. I don't know if anyone has any questions, clarification. Most of you are 
probably familiar with that. I will, but I'll wait till we go to these. Okay. <laughs> now Alex All right. is going to talk. <laughs> um, so I too wanted to take a step back and try to explain the situation that's going on because I don't think I've done a very good job of, of it over the last three meetings. So I want to take a step back and talk about um, the different benefits that the city offers. So essentially, there's three categories of employees and past employees that we're going to be talking about. There are retirees that retired prior to 2013. Over the last several years since they've retired, their plan design has not changed. So they are still under the same health plan when they retired. This generally means they have no deductibles, very few copays, and then very few uh, prescription drug copays. And I'll talk, I'll talk about that in greater detail. The retirees that retired after 2013, they have been rolling with the active plan. So any changes we've made to the active employee plan, they, they have also been impacted by those changes. And then we have our active employees. Um, did you uh, did you want to go through every bullet point or? I think the top bullet points are probably the most the most important. important. Yeah, the ones that are bolded. <clears throat> um, if you want to go to the next slide, this is what I'm talking about. So essentially, we have two different health plans. We have pre 2013 retiree health plan, and then the post 2013 retiree and active plan. And then just as a quick reminder. Um, I believe it was July of 2018, we implemented the Humana Medicare Advantage Plan. Uh, that was a big driver in reducing the city's OPEB liability. And I think that plan, um, while there was some trepidation to undergo it for the post-65 retirees, I believe that plan has been relatively successful and we, we rarely hear any complaints about that plan now. So here is what the plans look like if I, am, if I retired prior to 2013. Um, I have generally no out-of-pocket costs for in-network services. The closer I retired to 2013, I may have some office visit copays. It's generally ten or twenty dollars, and there may be some emergency room copays. Um, but it going all the way back, there is no deductibles, no coinsurance, etc. I either have a three dollar um, or a five dollar prescription drug copay, or a ten, twenty, thirty dollar drug copay plan. Again, the closer I retire to 2013, I'm much more likely to be on that 10, 20, 30 plan. So I just wanted to lay out a couple of claim examples. The first one is if I'm a member who takes a specialty medication that costs $5,000 per month, my only out of pocket for the whole year would be $360. That's if I'm on the $30 drug co copay plan. If I'm on, a, on the $5, obviously it's $60 per year. So very little out of pocket costs. The same example is if I, uh, claim example number two, if I have an in ex extensive inpatient stay for 30 days that costs $200,000, my out of pocket is zero. Again, no out of, no deductible charges. There are currently 102, although I believe 98 is the, the new number. Um, so there are a few people that probably moved into the Medicare plan. Um, but when I pulled these numbers, there were 40 singles, 44 employee plus one, and then 14 full families. Um, that were enrolled in this, this plan. This is just a quick outline of the post-2013 retiree inactive plan. Uh, there are currently 481 actives and 111 retirees in this plan. Um, it's currently a $100 deductible for single, $300 family. Uh, the out-of-pocket maximum is $4,850 or $9,700. Single family, there's 100% coinsurance, so the employee uh, is fully covered after they've met their deductible. Um, there are some co-pays for things like the emergency room, office visits, uh, urgent care, et cetera, and prescription drugs. Uh, any questions on the current plans before I jump into the options that we have laid out here? Sure. Sure, go ahead. So comparing to the pre-2013, for those exact same claim examples, <coughs> they be paying. So if I took a specialty medication, what, what would the post? Would yep. Pay with these same yep. Examples? So I would be paying a hundred dollars per month for that prescription drug. So it's five percent up to a hundred dollars. So I'd be paying twelve hundred dollars a year out of pocket, and for the extensive inpatient stay, I'd be paying one hundred dollars for my 
um, deductible, and then things would be covered at 100% after that. Moving forward, I'd be paying, if we go with the recommendation for the active plan, it'd be $250 plus 10% of the remaining bill up to that $1,000 maximum. So it'd be uh, $1,250 that I'd be paying out of pocket for that same service. And with the changes that we talked about at our last meeting, that affects mostly the 20, the pre-2013? Post-2013 post retirees and the actives. Mm -hmm. So if we go with the original recommendation, the pre-2013 would keep their exact same plan design. They'd just be paying 11%, so they'd still have very little out-of-pocket for their medical plans. The 11% bump, would they see the full delta of that? Depending on where they are in terms of the cap, the it could be yes. Whereas yeah. the post-2013? They're in the same boat. Yeah, and they And they get the plan active. design changes. And they roll. And if they retired in 2016, which was one of our lowest premium years, then they have a larger amount that they're paying for the cap. Okay, so if we can transition to the big sheet, and for those that are sitting uh, in the audience, there's a pile of these in the back of the room if you'd like to follow along. I think I have about 40 of them printed back there, so... Um, so the original recommendation that we brought forward uh, a few meetings ago now um, would increase the active premiums by 7% and the retirees premium by 11%. Um, we have all of the same plan design changes that we've been talking about. I do want to point out one addition that we have not spoken about. About halfway down the sheet, it says fourth quarter deductible carryover on the left column, all the way to the left. Oh, it's, it's, the it's the finish line, yeah. Oh yes, right here. So this came to my attention a few weeks ago that the city still has this, this built into their plan. This is a very old plan design that a lot of municipalities had. Uh, quite frankly, none of the municipalities I work with still have it. Um, essentially what it means is if I meet my deductible in the fourth quarter of the plan year, so for our plan, that's December, January, and February. If I meet my any deductible dollars in that time frame, it would roll over into the following year. So let's say I go for a service in January and I meet the full family deductible of $300. That means for the next plan year, I would have no deductible charges because it rolls over. Um, yeah, it's an old plan design. I haven't even seen this before, um, and I've been doing this for five years. Um, Right now, it's probably not a huge deal given our deductible levels are so low, but as we look to increase those, it's something I'd like to remove. It's just to get in line with industry standards. Um, so that is a change that was not discussed during the previous two meetings that I wanted to point out that we did add. So other than that, the original recommendation stays the same. Is there any questions about that recommendation? Mr. Chair? All in remain. Again, what's the amount that we need to make up in order to keep the fund going? So right now our fund balance is about four, a um, little over four million. We were running the 2000 preliminary, 2019 preliminary numbers today, and it looks like we're going to be at least 600,000 over budget, if not 800,000. And that means higher claims than expected and drug costs than expected, once again, which is seeming to be a trend. Okay. So just so for December, it was expected to be ninety thousand, and it was one hundred and twenty. Drug, yeah. Just for the last half of December, it was the drugs were thirty thousand dollars higher than they ever had been before. Mm. So it just keeps on going up. So yes, what do we have to make up? It's a tough number. We have to make up a lot. We really industry standard wise, we need to be between six and a half and seven million with our plan size for a fund balance for run out and things like that. Close um, to four. We're close to four, and we're going to go and down to down. three five. We're probably at three five already today. Okay, so the next three options that we're going to discuss are an attempt to reduce the premium burden on retirees. So option one um, would increase the actives for seven percent. It would decrease 
the post 2013 retirees from 11% to 7%. So they would truly roll with the actives. So whatever the actives get in both premium in increase and plan design changes, the post 2013 retirees would incur as well. The pre 2013 retirees have a choice. They can keep their current plan design at 11% or if they would like to reduce their premium burden, they too can roll with the actives. If they choose to roll with the active plan that we're recommending, their premium sh would not increase for the following plan year. So they change plan designs, their premiums would not increase from this year to next year. They have a 0% rate increase. Um, all of the other plan design changes for that new active plan and retiree plan, should they choose it, would be the same as the original recommendation. So all of the same plan design changes, increases to deductible, co-pays, co-insurance, all would be the same. Mr. Chair. All of me. Why is that uh, in network deductible amount highlighted? Probably by accident. We, we've had a lot of variations of this as we've been working through it, so okay, it probably was sure. different at one point. Um, yeah, and we just, just tried to highlight the one things that were different, so that should not be highlighted I think also I don't know if you're going to talk about the things on the bottom those if you want to talk about sure. those I can jump so in. one of the things that um, we're trying to mitigate and look at the long-term um, financial health of the city and the cost um, so we're if if this if the committee would go with this there's some different things that should consider having people um, perhaps not participate in anymore um, but also limit something so any lim limit the retiree percentage increase to no greater than double than the active increase based on their group cost um, so, and we're talking percentage increases so the dollar amount was not necessarily correct percentage increases mm -hmm. um, retirees roll with the actives as Alex mentioned um, limiting family com coverage to 10 years or age 60. Can you talk about that 12%? Okay. Um, the 12% has to do with the premium share percentage right now. Some people pay 5%, some pay 7.5. Um, likely, um, this will go up at some point from 12 to 14 or 15%. They would roll with the whatever the actives so that 12 percent is based off of the percentage off the capped amount not their total cost right it wouldn't be 12 percent of the total premium it would be 12 percent of the capped amount and then any difference they would still be responsible for i just want to make that clear because i was confused by it <laughs> okay then the limiting the family coverage um, if someone leaves the plan they can't come back um, coverage ceasing at age 65 or Medicare eligibility that's something that would bring us in line with a lot of the other comparables as I showed you before um, but also providing the retirees to uh, the ability to participate in our voluntary benefit plans at their full cost such as the dental insurance um, and vision insurance we just added the vision last year um, since our health plan only covers um, the eye exams. This covers, like, I believe per person is $150 worth of contact contacts, glasses. glasses, yeah, whatever. Um, and then if the con city continues to have the Medicare Advantage program um, allow the retirees to participate in that at their full cost. I mean, they're, the city's um, Medicare Advantage program has very rich benefits um, so I a lot of people that I'm familiar that I'm aware of have actually moved off of that even to save more money per month because of the rich they're paying for the rich benefits but that's probably dependent upon people's health and their preferences so those are um, some things that the committee should definitely consider trying to balance um, giving the lower increases with long-term fiscal health of the city. Okay, basically, the, those things listed. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. No, other than me, go ahead. <laughs> These things listed at the bottom are those things that bring it with rolling with the actives. Correct. 
some some, some of, of them, some actors? of it just is you know conditions of what's going to be offered while they <laughs> retire. Got it. And for for most most part, um, if you were hired after two thousand eight for a general employee, you don't get um, you you uh, don't have coverage for life. Mm -hmm. So um, you just have it till <clears throat> Medicare eligibility. So yeah, in that regard, it would be rolling with the actives. Mm -hmm. The total benefit plan people have it just for 10 years after retirement, so. Any other questions about option one? Um, option two then is essentially creating a separate plan for retirees. So the actives would still increase at 7% with all of their plan design changes. Then this plan would allow for all retirees, both pre and post 2013, to have a 0% increase for next year. Um, if they chose that option, their plan design is below. Everything is the same from what we talked about, other than the highlighted change in network deductible. That would increase to 750 single, 2,250 per family. All the other copay changes and prescription drug changes are the same as what we propose with the active plan. So this would allow both sets of retirees to get to a 0% premium contribution um, by choosing this plan. If they wanted to keep the plan that they are on today, they could do so at the 11% increase. A lot of the same changes on the bottom are what Rebecca just talked about under option one. Option three is a 7% increase to everyone. Um, if this obviously for the actives and the post 2013 retirees, they would get the below plan design. Again, everything is the same. The deductible is the only difference. It would be 500 single, 1,000 family. All, then everybody in those two classes would get a 7% increase. It, then the retirees that retired prior to 2013, <coughs> they could either take the 7% increase at this plan or an 11% increase at their current plan level. Those are the three alternative options to our recommendation that we've brought forward. So option three is the one that gives the retirees choices of which one they want to go with. Is, is that correct? Well, well or do the, they all? the one that gives all retirees a choice is option two. Okay. Because they have a choice of staying where they are today or moving to this alternative plan. Really, options one and option three, the only retirees that have a choice are the pre-2013 retirees. The post-2013 retirees are really tied to what the actives do if we don't give them a different choice. Option one and option three for those post-2013, or pre-2000, I'm sorry, post-2013 retirees, at least their benefit or their premium share is being reduced from 11 to 7 percent. Mr. Chair. Alderman uh, Vitale. Yeah, I would like to ask you, uh, say uh, any employee that uh, retired prior of uh, 2013 and, uh, I mean, he choose to uh, opt out from the uh, city insurance, and, and already is getting, say, if he's 65, and he's collecting Medicare Part A and Part B already. So when you say that, if they go to uh, to an insurance HMO, Gold Plus, uh, Humana, or, uh, will be a lot cheaper than uh, stay within the uh, city? I'm talking about the 65 and over, you know, once a day, they're in Medicare. So your Medicare premiums a lot is going to depend on your individual situation. So I can't say whether it would be much cheaper or not. I will say that the Medicare Advantage program that the city offers has shown to be pretty competitive with the marketplace. We have quite a few individuals that elected so, that plan. So my question is, what's the monthly premium on that? Uh, the members pay 200 and It's 495.11, and they pay 50%, so yeah. 247. So I'm talking for myself. So I go with uh, Humana World Plus. My monthly payment is zero. So the uh, copay, I mean, even with my uh, prescription drugs, is a lot better than what I had before. 
with us. Yeah, and I would encourage all retirees. You know, you know. That, see, that's why I bring that up because I think uh, somebody should get educated, spend time on a website, and shop around because there's a lot of good things out there that doesn't cost. So if you go to hospital, we pay the first. Uh, Say uh, for four days, pay the, the uh, three hundred dollars per per day, you know. And but but if, if you really digest that, I mean, monthly you don't have no premium. So and the doctor visit is just as, as the same twenty dollars with zero. The one I have it's zero. To go my family doctor pay zero. Yeah, I, and I would encourage. You know, you know, and and that's why I brought that up because I think. Many people don't realize that they can go out there and shopping if, if they're over 65. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about right now. So, uh, and the fact that it is, it's hard to say, but times are changing in the industry of mm -hmm. health insurance. So, uh, in private industry, I know people that pay over $300 per month. The coverage is very minimum. You know, they, they have to pay a lot of co mm -hmm. And that's one of those things that I, I kind of weigh, you know, I mean, uh, it's sad, you know, to uh, sometimes make changes, but that's part of the uh, life, you know. I learn a lot, so I, uh, that's why I have to say that. Can you give you the cost savings? Yeah, okay, what were the costs? We tried to cost keep savings it. in each one of these. So we tried to make everything cost neutral to the original recommendation okay. so that the city is not in a any worse off spot than what it is today from a financial impact so any one of these would accomplish what the original recommendation did as from well. a from a and premium a, standpoint and of yes. course you don't have a crystal ball we don't know how much <coughs> the market's going to change in two Correct. years or or how many people are going to select what plan and things like that. Yeah, Mr. Chair, this my, my question next now we've got four options sitting on the table Call this option zero because mm -hmm. it's kind of the baseline. Um, are you saying the original plus another? Or are you saying pick one? It would it would generally pick be two? pick one. Um, so our original recommendation stands. They're kind of, at least in my opinion, we've had some discussion about this <clears> today. Um, the first three, the original recommendation, option one and option two, are like one A, one B, one C, in my mm -hmm. opinion. So any of those first three, I think, are the most plausible. Um, option three, while it's viable from a financial standpoint, my goal is really to keep the benefits as the benefit level, so when I'm talking deductibles, et cetera, as low as possible for the actives and the people that roll with that plan. Once we get up to 500, 1,000, you know, if we need to make additional changes next year, it, it's just it's, it's a slippery slope. I'd like to keep the deductible low levels for the vast majority of your health plan as low as possible. So while option three is financially viable, it's it's my least favorite option on this sheet. And you can see on the top, excuse me, Please. you can see the impact on the active employees, even with the original recommendation, the possible impact um, in addition to the premium is 2450 for the other ones it, and under option three is 2700. Mm -hmm. so. And they're only possibly getting a maybe a two percent increase, depending upon things, and that would be towards the end of the third or beginning of the fourth quarter. So then you're saying we need, we would pick one of these forever. And so my my question on the what you call one B one C, and the number two would be are contracts at the time that they were signed or any of those going to be impacted by this so let's say we pick option one and we require retirees to roll with the actors Does so that affect any of the contracts i had a conversation with uh, one of the city attorneys there is nothing in the old collective bargaining agreements that defines their benefit levels um, now it becomes the city's decision on if you want to require it um, there's been a past practice in the city, and what does that past does that past practice trump what is in a written contract? I would want the opinion of the city attorney to be here uh, before I would say recommending. What we're recommending in all of these options is a choice. So if they choose to take a different plan to reduce their premium burden, that's their right and their ability. We're not forcing anybody to take a new plan. 
Does that answer your question? Sort of. Because if we're saying everyone's going to go with option one. So if, if we go with option one, the actives and the post-2013 retirees don't get a choice. Their plan design is what it is, and their premium increase would be 7%. It's mm -hmm. the same as the original recommendation. Correct. Uh, other than that yeah. the retirees could reduce their premium burden right. from and 11 to 7. I'm not to one. I'm just using no, yeah. an example. example. Okay. Your pre-2013 retirees would have a choice. They can continue on the current plan they have today, With but the their rates go up 11%. Mm -hmm. If they would like a 0%, they don't want to pay any more in premium, they can roll with the active plan. Which means they'll take on a higher deductible, co-pays. Mm -hmm. None of these have co-insurance, if I remember. They do. They, they all have 10%. They all they have a 10% co okay, mm -hmm. It would be the same as the active plan that we're recommending. Okay. But we should make clear, though, we're taking a bit of a risk with those plans, right? Because we don't know how many. We could get all of the post-2013 retirees to take it and take 7%, and no changes for the post-65, the pre-2013. <coughs> And it would make the plan less less viable. So there is some. We'd be back here in a year, perhaps, looking at more changes. It it's seems it's the. I'm sorry. No, you go. You're the you're the professional. You're it, paying you. It's the. Yeah. <laughs> this is the only way that we can reduce the retiree premium without completely gutting the the active and the post 2013 retiree plan. Um, to have 100 or so people with no out-of-pocket costs in their medical, I can't keep those premiums low enough to keep it viable for forever. So it's this is the only way I can give them a choice. If they like their plan, and to use the, the, the famous line now, if they like their plan, they can, they can keep it, and that's not a lie. Um, um, or if they, you know, want to reduce their, their premium burden, they just take a different plan. So... Or if all three stink, there's the private market as well. But yeah, I feel these are. Probably I don't think there are better, better plans, and they're in the private market, right? Yeah, it seems like option one is the best for everyone concerned, and and it gives retirees uh, that are affected a choice as to how to proceed. That seems pretty fair to me. Sounds like HR is <laughs> going to be busy. Yeah, that's right. Because and there are lots. Yeah, it, it's the management makes it more more difficult. Different choices and different plans. Who's on what choice and what plan? But and that's something that I think our staff can do. We have fifty three plans right now. So yeah, yeah. It's really for the actives. None of these affect. These are all pretty much the same for the actives. Correct. Except the last one. Except for the last one. Mm -hmm. Then the deductible increases substantially. Mm -hmm. When you go from 100 and 300 yes, yes. and you don't have the increases that other people are getting, that's a big challenge, especially we tried to list um, the median um, salary is 56000 so it's pretty impactful for employees at that level. Hopefully, a lot more people will use the flexible savings account so they can use pre-tax um, money for that. Do you still have an HSA plan available? Correct. There's a little um, right above the bottom. Oh, there there's some changes to that that would be part of. We haven't spent a lot of time on that just because there's, I think, six individuals on the plan. Six or nine. Although if these changes, it might make it more desirable for some people to go, go that route. Um, and so if, let's say, we went with option one or option two, are we going to allow people to switch back and forth every year, or are we going to say we choose once and once, this, is, this is the this is choice. Well, I would we say offer a choice again in the future? If a pre-2013 retiree wants to come off the plan that they currently have, we would allow that choice to be made every year, but once they leave those old older grandfathered plans they, they can go back they would then continue to roll with the active so if the active plan again changes next year their plan would be impacted as well otherwise they would leave right before they're going to retire so they could get the medicare coverage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay are there any other questions from the committee or the older persons present mr chair alderman weigel back to the beginning 
um, we were talking about the income side of the equation. How far below the levy limit le levy limit are we right now? Levy limit we're really not restricted by at this point because we have we borrow each year and so there's an adder in the levy limit calculation for that. What we're up against is our expenditure restraint right, limit. Right. Yeah, okay. And we're zero dollars away from our top limit. <laughs> We and yeah, and no. I've asked this question before, but I think other people might be interested that expenditure or state program is a state program that they offer to all municipalities over five mil over five dollars per thousand on a tax rate. Okay, and the minis and everybody that qualifies for it takes advantage of it. Um, Would you say communities have opted out at different times? You know, when your payment's one point five million, it's a lot harder to opt out than when your payment is. 200,000 or something like that if you had some kind of challenge or some kind of big project that you wanted to exceed the limits on you would be more likely in that scenario I've known over the last 15 20 years a handful of communities that have opted out of expenditure restraint usually for one year because they want to reset it unfortunately for us that would cost us 1.5 million dollars and mm -hmm. probably not very likely so a community could opt out and then come back into it the next year right. okay. South Milwaukee just did that Okay. Mr. Chair. Oh, Mayor May. I think to your point, when you look at these, um, yeah, like, like you said, option three is a no brainer to be dropped. I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> there's nothing to be gained by anyone, I don't feel, by doing that. Um, <clears throat> so, we were saying 1A, 1B, or 1C would really be the one that we'd want to go towards, right? Mm hmm. And two one, effects, a, one A though is that's the original recommendation. Yes. I'm sorry, yeah. One B being one, 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 one title one option B. one. That's right. That's in this right, column right. here. Yeah. Um, I, I call them one A, one B, and one C because all three I think are similar and, and viable options. It's just what choice, if any, do we want to give to any portion of the retirees? Option two would impact our employees more, or active employees, I should say. Do the deduct to the deductible. So the so under option two, I want to clarify, the actives would have the same plan under the original recommendation in option one, 250, 750. Oh. Option two is, you see at the top it says retiree only plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if the retirees wanted to have a 0% and have their own plan, it would have a much higher in-network deductible than currently today. So option two is retirement only, uh, actives get the original recommendation. Yeah, and some people might be wondering why the, there's such a difference in that deductible amount because there are fewer retirees that we had to increase the dollar amount to make up the premium difference that we'd be losing so they're basically subsidizing themselves in option two or one c as i've been calling it option one um there's there's less we need less room there which is why we keep the deductible lower for everyone and really the difference between option one and option two is the pre and post retirees are both Eligible to, to get to zero percent under option one, the post 2013 retirees would still be at seven percent, mm -hmm. which is down from 11, uh, but still, I understand a financial burden to them. So, and just from our past discussions regarding option two, we've discussed setting retirees separately into their own plan, and we decided no, we don't want to do that, that would be unfair to the retirees that they're higher users of health insurance and if you have higher users and a plan all along all by themselves well then they're going to have to pay higher premiums and uh, um, higher deductibles and a higher co-insurance in order just to make that plan uh, make it work uh, mm -hmm. so yeah I, I think that that pushes us again to option one here but I'm not prepared to vote on this tonight or act on this tonight necessarily. We've got lots of folks, of course, that are very interested, and I think we need some feedback. Uh, we do have another administration and finance meeting scheduled for Monday at 6 p.m., and that's uh, Monday, January 6th. We, we, we could. Do, do you need Please. To, I was just wondering if, um, if there's a need for that are you going to hear feedback or are you just getting feedback individually because I don't know that we have any more information to share we can certainly share the same information again sure but um, or no. people can watch the video it should be available tomorrow yeah thanks Ms. Grill where you're going I think is the right direction right we yeah I, I, I think I know where I stand and where I feel just want to 
they had, take some time for our other committee members to mull this over and hear from people. And then, right, we'd be looking at our next council meeting, which is the, the 7th. Yeah. Okay. Very good then. Very good. Mr. Chair. Alderman Weigel. Are we going to leave that sixth meeting on the schedule and potentially cancel it? Or are we. We would have to decide by tomorrow because yes. we have okay. to send an agenda out. So if you um, change your mind, you have to let me know before <laughs> the end of the bus business day tomorrow so we could get the agenda well, out. The consensus right here. I mean, I'm expecting to hear some from some of our yeah. constituents. <clears throat> this is going to be, this full document was a it's handout today. It's posted already it's online. posted online for everybody to, to mm -hmm. read and mull over. I'll be sharing it with the department heads after I unhighlight it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. His cell phone. I'm his his cell, phone. cell phone. His cell phone number? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm happy yeah, to, to give it up. mine in there. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So then there's no meeting. So no meeting no. Is, is our no. consensus here no. for Monday. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it up at the council meeting next week. Okay. And between now and then, if there's anything else you want us to look in or look into or price out or questions, please let us know. We can certainly do that. We've been mm -hmm. working on this every day <laughs> since literally every day <laughs> since the last meeting. All right, is there anything else to properly come before the committee before we adjourn? Uh, then can I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. All right, thanks everybody.